The Inquisitor by Thomas Ligotti Read by Jeff Clark The room in the tower seemed to have closed in upon him while he slept, so he measured it off again and found its dimensions to be unchanged. His mind still uneasy, he measured it a second time, and then a third, pacing between the walls of the room and the tower. I am measuring my own coffin he whispered to himself while staring intently at the splotched stones of the floor. Once more he examined every corner of his bare cell. Then he wandered over to a low door and, laying his cheek against the heavy, splintered wood, he squinted through the tiny openings in the iron grill, surveying the circular corridor of the tower. First he gazed in one direction and then, shifting over to the opposite side of the grill, in the other. Both directions offered the same view, cell door after cell door, each with an armed guard beside it, each progressively shrinking in the circular perspective of the corridor. It was the uppermost level of the castle's highest tower, a quiet place when all the prisoners were at rest. Then a tight-lipped moan broke the silence, waking him a second time from a second sleep. Again he measured off the dimensions of his cell, examining every corner, and surveyed the circular corridor through the tiny openings of the iron grill. Yearning for diversity, he wandered over to the arch-shaped window of his prison cell. This aperture, the only means of escape aside from the low door, was constructed to include four pairs of sharp metal spikes, two pairs projected from its right and left sides, and two closed in from its top and bottom. Together these four pairs of metal spikes formed a cross whose parts did not quite join together. Notwithstanding these pointed impediments, there remained a perilous descent groundward. No means for securing either grip or foothold crucial for such a climb appeared on the castle's outer walls, nor was there any possibility of concealment, even during the darkest of the castle's watchful nights. In the day, the yard-shaped window offered a view of sunlit mountains, blue sky, and rustling forest, a seemingly endless tableau of nature which in other circumstances might have been considered sublime. In the present circumstances, the mountains and forest, even the sky, seemed thick with human enemies and natural obstacles, making the mere dream of escape impossible. Still, he often did dream of accomplishing this feat. Someone was now shaking him, and he awoke. It was the dead of night. Outside the window a bright crescent moon was fixed in the blackness. Within the room were two guards and a hooded figure holding a lamp. One of the guards pinned the dreamer to the floor, while the other reached underneath his ragged shirt relieving him of a hidden weapon he had recently formed out of a fragment from one of the stone walls in the tower room. Don't worry, the guard said. We've been watching you. Then the hooded figure waved the lamp toward the doorway and the prisoner was carried out, his feet dragging over the dark stones of the floor. From the room in the tower they descended by means of countless stone staircases and long torch-lit passages, to the deepest part of the castle far underground. The area was a complex of vast chambers, each outfitted from its cold earthen floor to its lofty, almost indiscernible ceiling with an incredible system of machinery. In addition to the incessant echoes of an icy seepage dripping from above, the only other distinguishable sound was the creaking of this formidable array of devices, with a refrain, now and then, of an open-mouthed groan. His body was put in harness and hoisted so that the tips of his toes barely grazed the floor. The hooded figure, through a sequence of signals, directed the proceedings. During a lull in his agony, the prisoner once again tried to explain to his persecutors their error, that he was guilty of nothing. Are you certain of that? asked the hooded figure, speaking in an almost kindly tone of voice. You are not even certain of the size of your cell, you measure it so many times each night. 
Were I in your place, I might do the same. Nothing is certain, my son. Tomorrow I may be in your place. Judgment is all that matters. Without it we would go mad and slaughter would reign until no one was left to say this is true and that is not. Embrace your judgment. By doing so you save yourself. It is the only way to keep steady in this world where nothing is certain. Do you understand what I am saying? You are the fortunate one. At these words, a look of profound confusion appeared on the prisoner's face. It was as if an interrogation were being conducted within him, and although no new manipulations had been employed, his entire body became grotesquely arched in agony as he emitted a single unbroken scream before collapsing into unconsciousness. Waken him, ordered the hooded figure. They tried but his body still hung motionless from the ropes, hunched and twisting in its harness. He had already been revived for the last time, and his measurements would no longer be necessary. All was sane and certain now that he was lost in a formless prison of nothingness.